In the decades since the United States became a nation, presidential politics has not been much of a mystery. The parade of candidates have all had similar credentials. That is, until the election of 1824. There did not seem to be a heroic Virginian who had served in the Revolution who was ready to become president again. And under those circumstances, there were a lot of sort of entrepreneurial candidates out there who thought, well, maybe this is uh, my turn now. Maybe, maybe my state can, can step forward. And it was very clear, as early as 1819, that there was a strong possibility that the party was going to splinter therefore throwing its power all over the place, and that the election would go into the House of Representatives. There was no party discipline anymore. The Federalist Party was dead. All these people were nominally members of the Democratic Republican Party, but the fact that they didn't have to unite against an opposition meant that they were every man for himself against each other. Four well-known Democratic Republicans vie for the position. William H. Crawford of Georgia, Secretary of the Treasury and States Rights Advocate. John Quincy Adams, son of the second president and secretary of state, and Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun, both strong proponents of internal improvements. Calhoun later drops out and becomes the consensus candidate for vice president. And all of these folks schemed against each other and reached out into the hinterland to try to get local notables in their states to endorse them in hopes that they could deliver blocks of votes. Well. It turned out not to work that way because uh, Andrew Jackson uh, had become convinced after the Battle of New Orleans that the whole country was sinking into corruption. So he allowed his friends to offer him for president and his name really caught on and the sort of operatives for the Washington insiders began writing letters to each other saying, who is this guy Jackson and how come these people aren't falling into line? I don't... The result was that Jackson got more votes than anybody else, both at the popular level and the electoral level, but he did not win a majority. And so the election did go into the House, and as we know, John Quincy Adams won that election, and he won it on the first vote. And in some ways, it's sort of a mystery how this happened. John Quincy Adams, not a terribly social man, not a terribly popular man. How did he end up getting all of these men in Congress to vote for him? As it turns out, it is Henry Clay who plays the role of kingmaker. He was the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and he had influence with his colleagues and decided to throw his vote to Adams. Clay had done that despite the fact that the Kentucky legislature had instructed him to support Jackson instead of Adams. And of course, Jackson had gotten the most votes out there in the country. So on those grounds alone, Andrew Jackson thought that the will of the people had been violated. But what made it worse was that John Quincy Adams asked Henry Clay to become his Secretary of State after he was elected. So that looked like Adams and Clay had made some kind of uh, corrupt bargain, Jackson called it, to settle not only who would be president this time, but who would be president next time. His election had unfolded under a cloud. But in his inaugural address, he presented a vision of the federal government, one that would serve the people. And he postulated great roads projects that would cross state lines. He postulated national universities and also what he called lighthouses of the sky. He wanted to build great centers of learning. He had, in other words, a national vision. But this was anathema, still in the 1820s. With breathtaking lack of public relations sense, Adams goes to Congress and says, I know your constituents don't want you to do this, but don't be crippled by the will of your constituents. Well. Uh, Congress was appalled. The speech was reproduced in newspapers all over the place and Jacksonian politicians grabbed it up and said, Sig! he does not believe in the will of the people. He does not believe that the American people are smart enough to run their own lives or their own governments. And 
Regardless of the merits of what it was that he proposed, they were determined to destroy him by uh, resisting everything that, uh, that he suggested. Even Adams' vice president, John C. Calhoun, begins to consort with the enemy. When he saw Adams falling apart politically, he wrote Jackson and basically made him understand that he would support him for president in 1828, and Jackson, in what might be interpreted as a corrupt bargain of his own, uh, signaled that he would welcome Calhoun's service for another term as vice president. Calhoun thought that he was much smarter than Andrew Jackson and would do a much better job and expected to become president himself after Jackson served one term because nobody thought that this old, feeble, uneducated crackpot could ever stay in the White House for eight whole years. So surely Jackson would be a figurehead and somebody behind the throne would actually run the country and Calhoun was sure that he was bound to be it. By the time the 1828 presidential election rolls around, the party has divided itself into National Republicans, Adams and his supporters, and Democratic Republicans, Andrew Jackson and his followers. The campaign, on both sides, degenerates into a war of personal invectives. In the end, Jackson's victory is decisive, but sectional. On March 4th, 1829, Thousands of Americans crowd into the nation's capital to witness the inauguration of Andrew Jackson as the seventh president of the United States. His inauguration was what Margaret Baird Smith called a sublime event, you know, and he conducted himself very well. But after the inauguration, when they had the official party, where, as Margaret Baird Smith said, ladies and gentlemen were expected, but the people came. After the ceremonies, the boisterous crowd pushes its way down Pennsylvania Avenue, following their hero to the White House. This huge crowd of people presses into the White House and they're breaking windows and they're standing on the furniture with their muddy boots and they almost press him to death wanting to shake his hand. And there's punch bowls flying. And this just seemed to say to Washington, oh my gosh, this guy has brought the people with him. And he was seen as ushering in the age of the common man. And indeed, under his guidance, a lot of the restrictions that kept men from voting would be dismantled, and more and more and more men than ever before would vote. Until the 1820s, only property-owning, tax-paying white males could vote, a relatively small number. When Ohio and other Western states join the Union, they choose to broaden the franchise, granting all white males the right to vote and hold office regardless of their economic status. And I don't think Jackson's movement would have been possible in the same way without that. But what we found is that the new voters and the old voters tended to vote about the same way, so that what the new suffrage requirements did was to expand the cast of characters and to reinforce the notion that one man's vote was always as good as another one and the politician who forgot that would be an ex-politician very quickly. Even though restrictions still exist, the level of interest in party politics intensifies, particularly now that electors in each state are selected by popular vote rather than by Congress. We sort of forget sometimes that mass party organizations of the Jacksonian era come on to the scene in a, in a political culture that was substantially hostile to the idea of party. The framers were explicit in casting parties as something that were antagonistic to Republican government because they mobilized parties on the basis of passions and interests. Well, those who were most nervous about the popular majorities argued back by trying to make as powerful the notion that their state, the government, the polity as a whole had certain kinds of interests uh, that were bigger than the clamor of the folks down below on the social scale. They uh, tended to be quite nervous about democracy. Uh, they tended to be worried about rapid change. In this sense, patronage was an important way of 
legitimating parties because it was justified as a way to bring the average person into government and make them a part of government. It wasn't just our betters administering the welfare of the nation and to individuals of average background and character. It was us participating in the process of Republican government ourselves, and we all had a turn. Now, being the man of the people sounds like a good thing, but not necessarily in Washington, and people were very afraid of him. He was a Washington outsider. He was from Tennessee, he had served a term in the Senate, but he was also uh, sort of dangerous. There were stories of him dueling. He was seen as a violent and angry man, a backwoodsman, just the worst of both worlds, sort of a hick, but a hick with power. The stories of Jackson's involvement in a duel prior to the presidency were true. The duel was related to two separate incidents that called into question both his honor and that of his wife, Rachel. The man who challenged him, an old adversary named Charles Dickinson. And Jackson actually was a very poor shot. He was nearsighted. Dickinson was, uh, was known for his marksmanship, and he'd been practicing for six months. Jackson had been told by his seconds, uh, don't fire first. Your only chance is to wait and just hope he doesn't hit you. And then you can take your time and you can shoot. Fire! And Dickinson saw the puff of smoke where the bullet had struck his dusty jacket. And Jackson swayed a little bit, and then he pulled down his gun and fired, but it didn't fire the first time. It was uh, half cocked, and he had to pull the trigger back again. And the question was, did he have the right to do that? And sure enough, Jackson was within a millimeter of being dead himself. The bullet had struck his lung, punctured his lung, and was within a millimeter of his heart. Afterwards, the complaint was that the reason that Dickinson had missed was that uh, Jackson was wearing a coat that was three sizes too big, and that it didn't fit him properly. And so there was a card that was going to be placed in the local paper condemning Jackson and uh, extolling the virtues of Charles Dickinson, his opponent, and Jackson said, every one of those individuals who signed that, I want their names. And the word got out, and suddenly <laughs> there are very few that, that actually signed it. As Jackson takes office, he and his followers are eager to extend the opportunities for government service. Many positions in the executive branch have been held by the Eastern establishment for a generation or more. Jackson was committed to the notion of an executive branch whose jobs were so simple that any American could do it, and the idea that every citizen should have an opportunity to participate in the administration of government because that was how we sort of learned to be good citizens. If you've won an election, of course you want people who were your friends to support you. Who wants to have an office full of enemies? And so patronage has a certain political necessity to it, a kind of urgent common sense. It's also pretty darn useful if you're trying to make a nation because one of the ways you can connect this capital, which seems so distant from the rest of the nation, is to bring in people from one's own home district. So patronage isn't necessarily a bad thing, but when Andrew Jackson did come into office, he was given a lot of grief about what seemed to be a spoils system because he wanted to replace the old corrupt families with fresh new blood, sort of a meritocracy. Patronage is not simply a distributive tool, a sort of a goodie that you can dole out in individual increments to people who have done good things for you, but it becomes a disciplinary tool that you can take away from people when they don't vote the way you want them to vote in Congress. So in some ways, a patronage party of the sort of antebellum era uses public offices as a way to sort of validate 
the legitimacy of, of, of party organizations as, as, as an idea. Shortly after he takes office, Jackson finds himself embroiled in a controversy with his vice president, John C. Calhoun. As a South Carolinian, Calhoun's future political hopes may well depend on how effectively he can negotiate relief from the tariff laws that his state considers abominable. South Carolina was run by an oligarchy of planters, most of whom had strong roots on the rice and cotton coast there around Charleston, the low country, uh, with sort of collateral branches in the plantation country inland. It was a majority black state, and <laughs> There were parts of South Carolina where the ratio of black to white was as high as 10 to 1 in these very heavily uh, concentrated slave plantations on the coast. The new cotton soils to the west were coming online and they were much more productive than the older, more eroded fields of South Carolina. So this old moneyed crowd around Charleston felt their money and their prestige and their power slipping away. And instead of blaming themselves or blaming slavery or blaming soil erosion or any outside cause, they uh, did the perfectly human and natural thing to do and began looking for a scapegoat. And the scapegoat in this case is high tariff rates. John C. Calhoun was trying to find a middle ground between secession or revolution and acquiescence to what he perceived to be a ruinous national policy what Calhoun did was pose a policy of nullification in which one state can nullify a national law, which then challenges other states to reconsider and provokes some arena for compromise. In this case, South Carolina said that they would not obey the tariffs of 1828 and 1830, uh, which were abnormally high and protective, and did not protect people who raised the staple crops the nullification doctrine does nothing to help Calhoun's standing within the new administration, in part because of a powerful rival in the cabinet, Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren seemed to have no ulterior motives, no hidden agendas or personal ambition of his own. His only desire was to serve the uh, renaissance Democratic Party and Andrew Jackson himself, and this short, plump New Yorker learned to ride a horse so that he and Jackson could go on horseback rides just to keep each other company when Jackson became no longer on speaking terms with his vice president. Of course, they talked strategy and they talked politics and basically the rest of the world became convinced that Martin Van Buren had become the voice behind the throne and that it wasn't Jackson, it wasn't Calhoun at all. Now, I don't believe for a minute that that was true. I think Jackson was his own man and I think uh, Van Buren got to his, that position by letting Jackson know that as far as Van Buren was concerned Jackson would always be his own man. Jackson's cabinet choices had already caused a stir in official Washington. Jackson's people were by and large unknowns on the national scene. They had not distinguished themselves in congressional leadership before he appointed them. And so there were a lot of people who had made their reputations through long-standing service in Washington who looked at these outsiders and said, who in the world are these people? No one in Washington was terribly impressed. They called them a millennium of minnows. One of the people that Andrew Jackson rewarded with a cabinet post was John H. Eaton, who had been a longtime friend and supporter from Tennessee. He became Secretary of War. That was all right with Washington. The problem was that John H. Eaton had a longtime liaison with a woman that Washingtonians knew only too well, a woman named Margaret Timberlake, who had been a boarding housekeeper's daughter, very, very pretty woman. And the rumors long before the election were quite rife that she and John Eaton had some sort of affair going. Now, she had been married and then a widow, and he was a widower, but still, it was somewhat scandalous. Well, all this might not have mattered in Nashville, but in Washington, 
then as now, the wheels of government turn around who's inviting whom to dinner and who shows up at whose reception and who's returning calls to so on. And wives are a crucial part of that. If a wife will not play ball with her husband's political career, you know, there's a real problem. Well, Jackson's other cabinet officers were married to women who said, I am not going to associate myself with that hussy. Jackson is determined to put a stop to such pettiness. And so he retaliated and he had social events where he didn't invite members of his cabinet. And the upshot of this after about a year and a half was that there was an impasse. There was no social life in Washington. And what is significant for us is that because society stopped, politics stopped. No political work could get done. He basically closed down the cabinet and he wouldn't allow them to meet. He began to take all of his advice from a group of even more rough and ready informal advisors whom they call the kitchen cabinet because they weren't polite enough to meet in the parlor. He said, this is a war for who is going to run this administration and by golly, I'm going to do it. In the meantime, Congress is wrestling not only with South Carolina's nullification challenge, but with a controversy over the disposition of Western lands. These two issues provoke a series of debates on the floor of Congress between Robert Hayne, a young senator from South Carolina, and Daniel Webster, the venerable Whig senator from Massachusetts. And in these Hayne-Webster debates, the two sides spelled out their views of what the Constitution was and whether it formed a permanent government or just a sort of loose association of voluntary states. With Webster, of course, arguing that the American Republic was a country that was indissoluble and that it could not be broken up. And, of course, Hayne arguing the opposite, that true liberty demands that we be able to come and go as we please and we not be shackled to the will of some imaginary national majority. No one is quite sure which side Jackson will take. The party faithful had a dinner here in Washington at the Indian Queen Hotel on Thomas Jefferson's birthday, and everybody after dinner had to give a toast. Well, Senator Haynes stood up and gave this long, discursive ramble in which he basically justified his course with Webster. And then everybody looked at Andrew Jackson. What are you going to say? And Jackson stood up and he held up his glass of wine and he said, Our union, it, it must, must be preserved. He didn't say anything more than that, but it was like this a slap in the face to South Carolina. Calhoun, despite that amendment, had to make some kind of reply, and he stood up, and he was shaking with fury, so much so that his wine glass was shaking, and some of the wine dribbled down the glass, and he was groping for his words, and he said, the Union, next to our liberties, the most dear. And so he had thrown down the gauntlet back. Andrew Jackson, as president, said, I'm elected to enforce the law. And therefore, I will hang the first person to the first tree who breaks the first law. And if that be John C. Calhoun, so much the better. Uh, he was raising essentially an invasion fleet in New York to sail into Charleston Harbor and blast uh, the city into smithereens if necessary. In the midst of this, Calhoun resigned as vice president, the first person ever to do so, in order to take up the Senate seat of a South Carolina senator who had died. And then Calhoun and Henry Clay were able to work out a compromise that revised the tariff downward over a period of 10 years, and everything's wonderful. Jackson, of course, didn't have to invade South Carolina. South Carolinians met in convention and repealed the Nullification Act, so I think a lot of people save face, but nobody learned much. Years later, President Jackson is asked as he is leaving office, Do you have any regrets? I regret that I didn't shoot Henry Clay or hang John C. Calhoun. I just find the drama irresistible, not only because I like drama, but because I think that was a period in our history. And again, we're talking about the period after the War of 1812 up to the 1850s, when these issues were huge but dramatic. I mean, there's a certain kind of drama today, but it's all manufactured. But at that time, apparently newspapers were passed from hand to hand. There were stump speakers. It was a restrictive, right, uh, anti-black 
anti-Native American, anti-immigrant. Women were not included. It, it, I would never make a claim that it was democratic in the sense of full participation, but it was democratic in many other ways, popular, a little vulgar, um, and oratory. The Jackson administration may promote broader involvement in government, but its purpose seems less to help farmers and laborers or the truly disenfranchised than to challenge Eastern elites. Jackson and his followers like the power they've achieved, and they'll continue to use it with little regard for anyone who stands in their way. The Unfinished Nation is a 52-part American history series. For more information about this program and accompanying materials, call 1-800-576-2988 or visit us online at www.intellicom.org.